I'd like to welcome all of our participants to today's webinar titled Antimicrobial Stewardship Perspectives from Stewards in the Trenches. I'm Marty Peterson, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project. This project was created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota with the mission to create a global community around the issues related to antibiotic resistance as well as antimicrobial stewardship. We are very excited today to have two antimicrobial stewardship directors from the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. They have developed successful programs that have also undergone a CMS audit, and they will be sharing their perspectives and experiences today. Those two stewards are Dr. Jessica Holt and Dr. Mary Ullman. In addition to these two speakers, we also have Dr. John Roshefer to provide insights and moderate our webinar as well. A little bit of background, Dr. Jessica Holt earned her PharmD from the University of Minnesota and completed her pharmacy practice and infectious diseases residencies at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. As an ID pharmacy coordinator at Abbott Northwestern Hospital in Minneapolis, she has led the development and implementation of a pharmacist-driven antibiotic stewardship program, which received 2011 ASHP Best Practice Award. Since then, remote ASP services have been expanded to four regional hospitals within the same health system. She also serves as program director for the PGY2 Infectious Diseases Residency. So we're excited to have her speak to us today. Our second speaker, Dr. Mary Ullman, earned her PharmD from Purdue University. She completed a pharmacy practice residency at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. She then went on to complete an infectious diseases pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic fellowship at the University of Minnesota. After training, she initially started as at Regents Hospital as a clinical pharmacist, but in the past years has been instrumental in creating a formalized antimicrobial stewardship program at Regents Hospital and also serves as the residency program director for their PGY1 residency at the hospital. And finally, our moderator, Dr. Rose Schaefer, professor, infectious diseases specialist at the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy. I will also mention he's a faculty advisor to our antimicrobial stewardship program project. And he is internationally known for his expertise in infectious diseases and appropriate antibiotic dosing, pharmacokinetics and dynamics that are critical for the appropriate antibiotic dosing to achieve efficacy and reduce resistance. And he has published numerous book chapters and manuscripts on this topic. So with that, I will, I will turn it over to Dr. Rose Schaefer and just remind our participants that we do encourage you to engage with us, our speakers, and we do have a chat box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And uh, I will be sending you messages there and encouraging you to engage with us via that chat box because all lines will be muted. And this is the way that we'll be able to uh, dialogue with the Q&A at the end of the, of the program. So Dr. Rose Schaefer, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, towards the end of the Obama administration, the federal government took a huge step in support of antibiotic stewardship and the One Health concept. The government mandated antibiotic stewardship and incorporated antibiotic stewardship into the hospital accreditation and reimbursement process, which provided an, uh, a long life uh, to this concept. Uh, today, we're going to hear from two ter tertiary care hospitals and their approach to antibiotic stewardship. But everyone's situation is different, and the trick is to find an acceptable approach in your unique environment. We all need to realize that we control a very small part of a very large problem. The, mar the modern antibiotic era is about 100 years old, and bacteria have been here for millennia. Bacteria are natural survivors. They are always working, mutating for a selective advantage, and have rapid doubling times. Our efforts are not in vain, but we need to acknowledge that this is a situation that we do not totally control 24-7. All right, I'll turn it to Jessica then. Hi, thank you for that introduction, Marnie and John. 
So to start off, I'm going to just talk a little bit about Abbott Northwestern Hospital. We are located in Minneapolis and are part of Alina Health, which is a not-for-profit healthcare system serving Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. Noted we have 13 hospitals and multiple clinics as well as rehab uh, locations. We also have a smaller retail pharmacy site and two ambulatory care centers. We are the largest not-for-profit hospital in the Twin Cities area with 633 beds. And we're most well known for our Virginia Piper Cancer Institute, our Minneapolis Heart Institute, and our Courage Kenny Rehabilitation Institute. We also do um, heart and kidney transplants at our institution as well as some more advanced heart failure type procedures like um, ventricular assist devices. And we had our full joint commission audit in November 2017. This here is who is on our antibiotic stewardship program. So our team, we are very unique in that it is a pharmacist-driven program. We have multiple private ID groups, so it really is a pharmacy service. We have two ID residency trained pharmacists as well as a PGY2 ID pharmacy resident. We also utilize our PGY1 pharmacy residents to review patients. We have five on site, and then we also have one that completes a four-week rotation remotely at one of our regional sites. We have a cardiology pharmacy resident who does do an elective four-week uh, stewardship rotation with us as well. And then we take multiple students throughout the year. We have nine uh, students that come from the University of Minnesota that each do a five-week block. But we also take other students from other colleges of pharmacy as well as students from the U of M that are doing acute care, we take them at one week blocks. So we have multiple different learners on rotation with us. This is a, briefly a list of our responsibilities as a stewardship team. So we review all patients at Abbott that are not being followed by an ID physician. We um, also review four of our regional hospitals. So one of them is a 10-bed hospital. The other ones are about a 45-bed hospital. And we review them remotely um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then we take curbside questions from providers and staff. And then we also sit on um, several of the Abbott and Elena ID committees. And we are the primary drivers of a lot of the policies, procedures, order sets, and clinical initiatives around infectious diseases for Elena Health. And then obviously we're also doing the precepting in provider and staff education. So when preparing for our joint commission visit, one of the big things that we looked at was just the CDC core elements. And if you're familiar with the joint commission standards, that's basically what they are, are those, um, those elements. And so the first thing that we did is we did do a gap analysis to see where we were, um, where we were missing items. But then we also created a document really highlighting each one of these items and how we met it. And that was the document that we provided to the Joint Commission surveyors when they came. So just to kind of go through it briefly, so as far as leadership, accountability, and drug expertise, these are just some of the ways that we have met it. So we do have an antimicrobial stewardship committee at Abbott, and the VP of Medical Affairs is our executive sponsor of that. And our hospital epidemiologists and myself are the co-chairs of that committee. And we have uh, multiple physicians on that committee that represent different specialties as well as infection control, quality lab. Um, we have a medical resident that sits on that. And then our pharmacy, our PGY2 ID pharmacy resident. Again, we do have two ID pharmacists with a 1.9 FTE. We do not have physician support for the stewardship program. Um, we definitely have system-wide leadership and support all the way up to our um, CEO. We have specific antibiotic stewardship goals for the pharmacy and infection prevention and control departments. And we also received gold status on the Minnesota Stewardship Honor Roll for acute care hospitals this past year, which was the first year that that honor roll was made available. 
As far as actions, um, I have talked about the daily review of all patients that we do. We also have multiple pharmacist-driven policies that are very common at other institutions. We do have a real-time blood culture review process that includes positive blood cultures going straight to our pharmacist, and they assess it based on an algorithm that we created, and they make recommendations to the providers in real time. We also have an aminoglycoside and banco pharmacy to dose protocol, as well as specific appropriate use criteria for vancomycin, both empiric and for destination um, or ongoing therapy. We have multiple system-wide guidelines, including procalcitonin use, staph aureus bacteremia treatment, and then inpatient and outpatient impaired treatment guides. And then we have um, a few different system-wide orders that's including sepsis and sphenic fever. And most recently, we created an outpatient uh, infectious diseases order set that's used in the emergency departments as well as in our clinics. For tracking and reporting of our stewardship program, uh, we do have a monthly ALINA report for all hospitals that includes total antibiotic use and then some of the different broad spectrum agents or classes. And then it also includes antibiotic cost per patient day. Specifically at Abbott, we create a quarterly uh, stewardship report. It includes the same information that is on the monthly ALINA report, but also includes initiatives that we are doing at our site, um, as, a, uh, as well as things that have been completed for the year. We also trend our antibiotic use with our C. diff rates. Our report at Abbott gets discussed at our stewardship committee and our pharmacy and therapeutics committee, which then reports into the patient safety and quality committee and the medical executive committee. We do have a yearly hospital antibiogram. We have um, resistance trends that are reviewed every month at infection prevention and control, which that group actually reports to the patient safety and quality committee as well. And then we are looking at implementation of the EPIC icon so that we're able to report our data into the NHSN AUR module. As far as the education piece, so when it comes to the Joint Commission, um, it, of note, they did take out the patient education requirement, but we did start on that piece before that um, requirement was taken out. As far as what we provide, so we do have an Alina Stewardship webpage that's an internal uh, webpage, and we include on there any recent presentations or clinical pearls that are that we have done. Um, also, if there are some free CEs around stewardship, we post them on there for pharmacists and providers. We do require annual education to all employees and to physicians upon credentialing and re-credentialing, and these are just on basic antibiotic stewardship principles. Anytime we have a new initiative or guideline come out, we complete education to providers at Abbott, and depending on what um, what the initiative or guideline is, that education may expand to other sites. And then we do have some patient education on antimicrobial use that's provided in the patient's welcoming pack up, packet when they are um, admitted to the hospital, as well as when they are discharged. So they get that in their after-visit summary, and that goes to all patients, not just those that are on antibiotics. And then finally, we also created a video for all of our staff on why appropriate antibiotic use is important. And this video was just a Q&A with one of our infectious diseases physicians within our system. And staff earn um, credit for that, for their health insurance, when they complete it. So it gives them an incentive to really watch that short video. And then with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mary to talk about Regions Hospital. All right, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Regions and tell you a little bit about our program. So Regions Hospital is a um, part of Health Partners, which is a nonprofit healthcare system serving um, Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. Um, we are comprised of six soon to be seven hospitals, as many as well as many uh, primary care clinics. And a unique thing about Health Partners is that it's also it's an insurance plan. So um, 
provides a little bit of different incentives for what we decide to work on. Um, Regents Hospital specifically is the largest hospital on the east side of the metro with 454 beds. Um, we are a level one trauma center for adults and pediatrics. We're also a nationally recognized burn center and also known for being our, the Minnesota's first comprehensive stroke center as well as having a large mental health unit with 100 beds. Uh, additionally, we are a Medicare disproportion, disproportionate share hospital, so we get a lot of um, of those types of patients in our, our population that um, may provide different comparisons as opposed to other hospitals. So our antimicrobial stewardship program didn't belong, didn't start until October 2016. Uh, we did a three-month pilot of our program in early 2016, and based on that um, progress, as well as the impending Joint Commission survey that would come a year later, we started in October 2016. Um, prior to the initiation of our program, policies like renal dosing, IV to PO, vancomycin, and aminoglycoside dosing, as well as a restricted antimicrobial list, were already in place. Additionally, the clinical pharmacists were already engaging with physicians and providers in selection and de-escalation of antimicrobials as part of the review of patients. Recognizing that strength, uh, we created this document because we wanted to emphasize at the start of the program, it, this is a team effort. It's not something that once the stewardship team is in place, no one else has to know anything about antibiotics. But we wanted to make sure that everyone kind of understood their role. Specifically for um, the ID or the stewardship program itself, um, currently we perform formal ASP services three days a week, but hopefully within the next month we are planning to expand to all weekdays. Um, the duties of the ID pharmacist were outlined as shown, primarily serving as a reference for pharmacists, physicians, PAs, anyone who had questions about antimicrobials, uh, they, they could call me and ask me about their antimicrobial question, as well as reviewing specific targeted antimicrobials. So when we first started this program, we were still working on getting days of therapy data to help guide us in terms of figuring out where are our issues. But based on what we know about antibiotic use and the ease of saying, I'll just use the broadest thing possible and it will help me uh, I'll know I'll cover whatever I need. Uh, we focus specifically on antishutamols and gram positives as for those patients that were on those, we reviewed those. Um, from those cases that we reviewed, I'd look for anything that was, there's a potential for de-escalation, additional testing, inappropriate therapy, uh, excessive duration of therapy, or other issues noted to be significant. Um, then later in the afternoon, those patients that I had identified, I would sit down with one of the ID physicians and discuss the cases. With, discuss the cases, and from that, we'd come up with a formal plan and a formal recommendation of de-escalation, check these tests, etc. Uh, note was left in the medical record for providers. Uh, clinical pharmacists were also very helpful in this process and that this was a new process for a lot of the providers and so that when they reviewed the patients the next day, they would notice our comments and help propel the physicians to be aware of those as well. Um, for, all the inter for all of the interventions that we did, we used EPIC and so we documented via events the recommendations as well as trying to identify the time spent and the acceptance rate at which these were for later tracking. Uh, other responsibilities that um, we got involved in was we had an antimicrobial subcommittee of the PNT, and we renamed that the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee and functioned similarly the same. As you remember, I said we had six hospitals um, in our organization when we first started looking at antimicrobial stewardship. And uh, because of that, they wanted to make sure that there was another hospital that was undergoing Joint Commission survey earlier in 2016. They wanted to make sure, or early 2017, I apologize. They wanted to make sure we were all on board and had everything the, um, 
that we could do as a group done. And so we have a health partners hospital and a microbial stewardship committee as well that we uh, participate in. There's also some interest in ambulatory care, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, and so we are we get involved in that. Um, at our hospital, because we didn't have antimicrobial stewardship um, initially, there is a specific program called Save Seven that targeted a lot of the value-based purchasing, so CLABZ, CAUTI, um, C diff. And as part of the C. diff improvement committee, uh, we were asked to join that as well, knowing that C. diff and antimicrobial stewardship are, are closely tied. Um, we also started working on policies, procedures, order sets, clinical initiatives, a lot of those same things you see at other antimicrobial stewardship programs, and as well as providing staff education as needed. Um, kind of outlining again, the different ways that we met the Joint Commission standards. Similar to Jessica, we underwent a Joint Commission survey in October of 2017. Um, we did conduct a, a gap analysis initially when starting the program, but also redid that at, at, again later on, a year later, and saw what we could and couldn't had done. Um, and so we included that as well as the different criteria that each met um, the specific standards in a binder. And I know our Joint Commission surveyor specifically looked at that before they, they came and discussed with us. So in terms of leadership, accountability, and drug expertise, um, we identified that we had had this antimicrobial stewardship committee, which is a subcommittee of P&T. Um, Health Partners has a pharmacy vice president that oversees all of the hospital pharmacies, and so he has served as our champion, as well as on the antimicrobial stewardship committee, we have representat representation from ID, pharmacy, hospitalists, um, infection prevention, IT, micro, nursing, data analytics, and quality. And they've, they've all been helpful because everyone brings a different insight to what we may be having going on in other areas of the hospital that could be easily translated to some of the stewardship initiatives. Um, we have 0.2 FTEs for an ID physician and 0.6 currently for our ID pharmacist. And we created an accountability document um, that was approved formally by our medical executive committee um, to demonstrate this leadership and accountability document or requirement. Now, in terms of actions, I think we described I described a little bit about our antimicrobial stewardship daily review. Um, another initiative that we spearheaded was the use of indications on all antibacterials, knowing that you know what you're treating, it's a little bit easier to figure out is it appropriate or not appropriate. Um, since we share the same EPIC throughout all six hospitals, this is something that we actually work together as a group to all formally endorse this so that it would make it easier um, on our IT professionals in terms of making sure each hospital didn't have a special case. So we, we worked on coming up with a group of about 20 to 25 indications that seemed appropriate um, and were reasonable throughout all the hospitals. Um, we also are currently still undergoing an ongoing discussion of antibiotic timeout, knowing that that's been identified specifically in the Joint Commission um, document as a possibility. Um, one of the big challenges we have is that we have two larger hospitals and then um, four smaller critical access hospitals. And so knowing that the way that we operate may be a little bit different from the way they operate. And so a one size fits all may not actually be um, what we need to use. And so figuring out how we can use the uh, EPIC to help us achieve this, but also understanding the different um, people behind it that need to make it happen. Uh, we have antimicrobial formulary restrictions, and that was revised once we, uh, has been revised yearly. We have our IV to PO as well as renal dosing protocols. We've worked on order sets. Um, specifically, we've worked on the sepsis order set, as again, as an organization, since this was something they wanted to make sure was the same across the organization. And so the um, antimicrobial stewardship committee um, the, organ the health partners organization actually came up with the specific antibiotic recommendations within that set. And then we've ideally, you, you want to do everything you can, but knowing that we were limited on time, um, we knew there were other areas of actions that we could work on in the next few years, but right now was not the, the time to do that. But we did have that identified in the gap analysis. 
um, and kind of came up with a plan. This is ma this is the things we would tackle first. These are the next things, and we included that in the joint commission review because I think at least it gives them an idea of we've looked at things, um, knowing that this is a new standard. We are planning to work on these things, and we've got some ideas on how to uh, go ahead. Um, as far as tracking and reporting, um, we do things very similar to what uh, Jessica has done. Um, we've, we actually utilize a, a third-party platform to track days of therapy. Um, but we're currently um, have actually been able to implement ICON through EPIC, and so we are planning to use some of those tools as well to monitor days of therapy and be able to report to NHSN. Um, prior to the start of our program, Micro has created a yearly anabiogram, and so they have graciously continued that process as well as monitoring resistance trends. And then these are shared with Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee, the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee, as well as um, different hospital executives in various meetings. We've gotten asked to talk at P&T. We've asked at the Safe 7 Initiative Committee um, that is focused on specific things in value-based purchasing. And um, we plan to do that on a quarterly versus yearly basis within that P&T committee, depending on um, ability to present that data as well as uh, just timing. Specifically for staff education, um, we worked on this again as an organization, um, being able to kind of pool our resources. And we created an online training module specifically for, as I like to term it, anyone who test, touches an antimicrobial um, should get some antibiotic about, or should get education about antibiotics. Um, we tried to focus on specifically in the initial one, current drug resistant issues, why stewardship is important, and a few pearls in areas like asymptomatic bacteria, wound cultures, and viral respiratory illnesses. Um, we had the same intent for content, regardless of whether you were a physician or provider or pharmacist, if you worked in the lab staff or you were nursing, but we adjusted some of the things based on um, input from some of those uh, people that helped create the document in terms of what was most relevant. And then again, I know that patient education isn't included in Joint Commission, but that was something we had worked on, and while it's not included, I think it's still important as we think about the impact everyone can have on antimicrobial stewardship. And so for general education, I think we did what many other sites did, and we had, we utilized those CDC handouts that kind of talked specifically um, about antimicrobials and how to prevent resistance and when it's needed, when it's not needed. Um, one other unique thing that we did is we knew that you have a more captive audience when you have someone who's on an antibiotic and they want to know about why are they getting this antibiotic. And so we actually had one of our quality people that works with us and she was quite clever and she noticed that the way that the phrasing of the Joint Commission education component for patients was very similar to a lot of the phrasing in um, the National Patient Safety Goals. And our nursing program, our nursing co colleagues in the organization had been working on something to create a checklist or a flow sheet that it would be part of the nurse's daily workflow to evaluate that and then have a way that it's documented that it's been addressed. And she suggested, well, this might be a place if a patient's specifically on an antibiotic, we could prompt the nurse um, through EPIC to give education about antibiotics. And so um, nursing liked this idea and, and approved it. And so now our education, our EPIC will prompt the nurse to talk about antibiotics, um, specifically in just three simple things, what they're using it for, what are some side effects they can think about, and then specifically that, you know, you should complete this entire regimen unless you're specifically discussed with the physician and that's not what they want you to do. And I think with that, I will turn it back over to John. Well, anytime you get involved in antibiotic stewardship, as Mary and Jessica are kind of pointing out, it's all about the data, and you're collecting lots of data uh, all throughout the year, and then you're comparing yourself to previous years, and you're doing trend analysis. So you, you kind of get to a point where it, what do you need to measure, how often do you need to measure it, and what's the metric you want to use to measure it with? And I think 
we'll find that technology is our best friend. The last thing you want to do is manually collect, manually interpret this information. These are ideal situations for computers, uh, and there's commercial software. I'm sure that uh, what's out there now and what's going to come in the future will be better and better. Uh, besides measuring antibody consumption, uh, benchmarking prescribers, I think, is a task that's always very interesting, especially if you can group them into internal medicine or surgery or critical care. And if people see how their antibody prescribing compares to other physicians in the same group that are generating essentially the same outcomes, that can change behavior uh, quickly. The other things that we're always interested in is bacterial identification from year to year. How many E. coli, how many staph, how many MRSAs do we have? Susceptibility to other um, antibiotics. And these are all tasks that will ideally be suited uh, to electronic means. And it's not something that you want to do. It's just going to take too much of your time. And so anything we can do to find ways to speed that process along uh, is certainly something that needs to be considered and implemented as soon as possible. And we'll move on here then. All right, so those are all great points, John. And you know, I think for each hospital, it really comes down to what resources do you have available and also what are you doing um, at your hospital. And so, you know, at Abbott, we are reviewing all of our patients um, pretty much 95% of the time, Monday through Friday. And so for us at Abbott, we are, we really look at our total antibiotic use and we always compare it to our hospital acquired CDI rate or Clostridium difficile rate. And so this has been something we have done from the beginning of our program. Our program started in 2009 and we have always linked it to the quality measure around C. diff reduction. And so for us, this graph here is probably the biggest piece of information that um, really has gotten us to where we are today. We didn't get our second ID pharmacist until 2015, and we tried um, before that, but this data really spoke volumes. And so before we added that second pharmacist, we were not getting to very many patients at Abbott every day. We didn't, we hadn't expanded to the regional hospitals yet that we review. So, you know, this graph here is pretty powerful. And I think, you know, when the Joint Commission Surveyors team, we gave them one of our stewardship reports. And this graph is what really blew them away. And not to say at all that, you know, the only thing we've been doing at Abbott is around antibiotic stewardship and, you know, decreasing antibiotic use because we've done a lot of infection control and environmental service things as well, especially around appropriate testing in the past year. But this is one piece of information. Um, and making it automated is, is really the key. When I started this process, I was having to do it all manually. And so now we do have you know, reports that have been built within our, our EPIC um, that I have a data analyst automatically doing for me. But our ultimate goal really is to get the EPIC icon so that we can start reporting into NHSN and try to benchmark against other hospitals that are similar. Um, a couple other things that we do report is our recommendations. So this is pretty pretty easy to track, especially for pharmacists. And so we track, you know, the, what recommendation we're making and whether it's accepted or not. And you can see that our biggest recommendation really is around just continuing and assessing duration of therapy. And our acceptance rate on these is pretty high. Um, it's always been mid to upper 80%. And that's very similar to the literature for ID physicians making recommendations to attending providers. So I think this also speaks volumes to providers that not only are we making a lot of recommendations, but they're also accepting them. And our recommendations that we track are not things that are done automatically per protocol. So if we do a, a renal adjustment based on a policy that we have, we do not include that as one of our recommendations. So these are recommendations that a provider has to accept. And then finally, the, the money slide. And 
um, for those that you know are are on the cost side of it, this is something that we put together, and it, it is somewhat um, you know potentially funny money. Antibiotics are hard. Um, at Abbott specifically, we don't have a lot of resistance here. Our ESDL rate is only about five percent, so you know we're not using some of the more expensive big guns. So it has been much easier to keep our antibiotic costs down. But this here goes to show you kind of the green line. There is the the cost that we have based on our days of therapy report. And if we had done nothing with a two percent inflation, the blue line shows you that. So you know, adding up the difference in each one of those years really equates to large uh, large dollar amounts. So, um, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Mary to talk about kind of what, what they're doing at Regions for measurements. Yeah, and very uh, similar to Jessica, we evaluate days of therapy trends and intervention rates and acceptance and resistance. Um, but one of the slides I wanted to uh, share here was um, this is what we had presented to um, our senior leadership um, to impress upon the successes of our programs. And I think that's an important thing when you're thinking about um, data as well, is who is the end user? I think in the antimicrobial stewardship world, everyone knows what DOTs are, understands what they are, and intuitively knows that if you decrease days of therapy, you're probably going to impact, um, you know, C. diff, resistance, lots of those things. But for those that aren't as familiar with that, I think trying to piece those things together. And so, on this slide, what I had tried to do was simply provide some um, context to we're looking specifically at days of therapy. And so we looked specifically at levofloxacin. And so this was a, this was a report, and then I added the specific shading where um, the purple is our, was our pilot period, and you can see there was a, a, a significant decline. Um, and then we waited a little bit, quarter two and quarter three, um, and then we restarted, restarted our antimicrobial stewardship formal program. And so you can see there's a significant impact into levofloxacin and days of therapy. Um, one of the other things we tied it to, similar to Jessica, is C. diff. And so because of our C. diff uh, cases that we had had, um, our, our program was involved in um, our C. diff review cases. And so every patient that got a hospital-acquired C. diff case was reviewed by the um, a, a phys ID physician, a nurse, uh, um, infection prevention, housekeeping, and pharmacy. And so we would go through and identify potential points for um, issues. I specifically looked at, were they on antibiotics? Were they on laxatives? Were they on a PPI? And kind of went through those. And so then we would meet as a group and identify and look at what seemed to be the main cause. And so it was a group decision. It wasn't just one person um, deciding that was it a housekeeping issue? Was it an antibiotic issue? Was it um, they should have they tested when they shouldn't have? Um, and so we actually were able to identify or qualify or quantify the number of C. diff cases that happened due to antibiotic use or there was an improvement for antibiotic opportunity, there was an opportunity for an antibiotic improvement in 15 of 37 cases prior to when we started doing our formal program versus seven out of 50 um, when we did after, after our program started. And so this is a larger time frame, a larger amount, and yet we had less cases. And this is ultimately what actually led to the ability for us to go to five days a week in the next month. And so I think understanding how your the end user and maybe some of the people that are going to be kind of pushing or controlling the purse strings, being able to speak some to their language, I think, helps them identify, yes, it's important, and this is why it's important, um, not only quality-wise, but there may be some financial benefit, too. I think we'll turn it back over to John. Okay. Bacteria present. If there is one present, what is the bacteria? And then uh, what is it susceptible to? And uh, with modern technology, uh, real-time PCR, we can essentially establish uh, what organism is there within hours of the blood or whatever specimen being obtained. 
Uh, with real-time PCR, we can get an idea of what the likely susceptibilities are, and we can identify uh, optimal antibiotic therapy. And that, of course, is something that's not taken place in the past. Uh, but we obviously have to make sure that whatever we're using, um, the measurement, it has to be timely and it has to be reliable. And if it's timely and reliable, I think you can get the prescribers to buy into it. And while we are kind of on the forefront, maybe, maybe the technology isn't quite where everyone wants it to be, um, just wait. That technology will be there. In the future, as we talk about antibiotic stewardship and in the next two, three, four, five years, um, this area of rapid, rapid diagnostics will improve dramatically. But again, the key is if you've got a rapid test, it's got to be timely and it's got to be reliable. If the physicians don't believe in the information that you're getting, they won't change their prescribing behavior. So uh, that's absolutely paramount that uh, everybody believes in it and in fact, it's established as being reliable. Uh, and then, um, I don't think I was going to talk about film arrays. Uh, it's just Jessica. Yeah, so I think, you know, the two things that you pointed out is that, yes, it has to be timely and it has to be reliable and your physicians have to believe in it. Um, you know, and with a lot of these rapid diagnostics, the big thing is going to be for um, for someone to provide education to the providers on the test. That's definitely one thing that we've ran into at our institution. Um, the other big thing is that the information or the result when it's available is acted upon in that it is um, somehow relayed to the end user, and the end user is, has the opportunity to act upon it. So at Abbott, one thing that we've somewhat struggled with here, um, we did institute uh, the blood culture film array back in April 2015, and we had developed a pharmacist process where our pharmacists were getting a real-time blood culture result. And then it was up to them to um, really kind of relay that message to the provider, but we didn't have anything in place to kind of guide the pharmacist on what would be an appropriate recommendation. And we didn't have anything for the provider either on what they should do with that result. And so in August 2017, we actually developed a blood culture algorithm that um, really looking at our antibiogram and what results would come from the blood culture multiplex PCR and giving them some empiric options and kind of what, what we would want them to do. So we had our ID physicians um, along with our pharmacy colleagues really approve that. And then we updated our pharmacist process to make sure that it was more solid and that they knew how to use the algorithm. And so really kind of what I'm, I'm telling you is that rapid diagnostics is not enough. And so you need some kind of stewardship process in place. And on the slide here is a study that was put out by Mayo Clinic in um, Rochester, Minnesota. And so this was really looking at the implementation of the film array blood culture ID panel. And the top line there is the control. So just the normal process on how we identify organisms. <coughs> And you can see there that, you know, it, it basically takes a while to ID it and then to de-escalate. So the ID is in the red and then the blue triangle is, um, is kind of the, the de-escalation piece. So if you just have the rapid multiplex PCR, you can see that the de-escalation really didn't change. It still is right around that 36-hour mark. And what you needed to have in place was an antibiotic stewardship program um, and some, some mechanism in place to really make recommendations. And you can see there that once that was implemented, you see a decrease in the time to de-escalation, so almost 15 hours. So really the rapid diagnostics itself isn't going to really help you unless you get that information to somebody and you make um, a recommendation. And Mary, do you have any comments kind of on your experience at Regions with rapid diagnostics? Yeah, so we have um, we have rapid, we have a, uh, we use uh, Veragene and we have it both for gram positives. I think we started that in maybe 2009, 2010. 
and recently just started with gram negatives, I think, within the past year. Um, that's been something on our radar to work on in terms of making an implementation process, but again, we don't have a way to automatically be notified. Um, the the micro lab automatically notifies the physician, and I think it would be similar to what you see here, is if they note that they're not covering something, they're probably going to escalate very quickly. It's the de-escalation that tends to lag. Um, okay, often we will utilize that when we're making our stewardship recommendations as, you know, here we see that it's likely E. coli, your Zosin is probably not needed anymore. Um, but again, with us being only Monday, Wednesday, Friday, sometimes that timely intervention is not there. John, do you want to move to the next slide? Okay. Um, I, I guess I was actually planning on talking about this, but I, I think if you are going to have a, a, a successful antibiotic stewardship, um, we just need to go back over many of the points that we've addressed, that you organizationally set this thing up to be successful, that you've got the right committee support, you've got the right champions in place, you've got the right number of FTEs of pharmacists and ID physicians helping to orchestrate this on a day-by-day -day basis. You bring in your IT people, uh, you've got the lab engaged in the situation. And what, one thing we didn't talk about so far, which was uh, has been a problem in the past, is if you're a teaching hospital and that uh, if you get your prescribers in, in line with what you're attempting to do and they understand all the policy, that's great, but if your uh, prescribers are turning over every uh, 90 days or so, uh, you're back to square one. And so uh, to keep your program going in a teaching hospital is a particular challenge in comparison to where you've got uh, basically a closed shop and uh, you kind of get to educate the prescribers once and then just kind of keep them in tune with what's going on. But you, you've got to have the right champions in the institution. You've got to have physicians that are supporting this. You have to have administrators that are supporting this. And then you've got to keep feeding the data back to people so that they understand uh, the value of this program, about treating people with the right antibiotics at the right time, trying to be cost effective in what you're doing, limiting adverse events like uh, Clostridium difficile, those are all very positive things that can be passed along through the committee structure in the institution to endorse your efforts at antibiotic stewardship. Yeah, so I think, you know, those are all great things to really make sure that your program is successful. And, you know, here are just some other tips that pretty much John has gone through most of them. Um, but my big one would be to really link your stewardship efforts with patient safety and quality initiatives. That's, you know, something that we did from the very begin beginning um, at Abbott and really across our whole system. And I think that um, link to patient safety and quality is what has really made us successful. And I would agree with that as well. I think specifically from my experience, the two things that I would pass along as kind of tidbits that I don't verily see often is um, we started antimicrobial stewardship only a couple years ago, and yet there are a lot of things that are antimicrobial stewardship that may have gotten started because of some of those quality or patient safety issues. And so I think if you're already there, it's sometimes easier to know what's going on, but if you're going into a new institution being asked to start this, I would say make sure you talk to a lot of people and ask them about, you know, what are you guys doing about C. diff? What are you doing about uh, CAUTI? Do you have IV to PO policies? There's probably a lot of those things there, and there may be some need for tweaks, but at least makes you let you know you're not starting from square one and having to make everything up and you can work within the structure that's there. And again, I would echo the fact that get to know your executives and make them your champions. Um, we had been trying, I think this was the third time we had tried to get an antimicrobial stewardship off the ground um, in the years that I had been at Regions. 
and I think the besides the joint commission um, deadline coming, as well as I think reaching out to to the senior leaders at our institution and multiple ones and helping them understand what antimicrobial stewardship is, why it's important to them, and letting them be your advocates instead of you tooting your own horn. I think that that says more if someone's willing to go out of their way to um, push forward your agenda than you pushing forward your own agenda. Mary and Jessica, I want to thank you so much for sharing your insights. You're definitely um, uh, leaders in the field, and um, I think that you've offered a lot of information that can be very helpful. I, I, we had some questions prepared, but we've also had a number of questions come in via the chat box from participants, uh, and I would like to to address some of those if you guys are would be open to that. Um, and John, I don't know if you could see them um, starting with question one. That and, and I'll I'll start it off, and then John, you go ahead and you can go forward with some of the other questions. But uh, it's about describing your hospital's emergency department and outpatient clinics, and how are each of you uh, addressing the need for antimicrobial stewardship in those settings? Maybe Jessica, you could go first. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think this is our, at least at Abbott, our next step um, for stewardship is, is addressing the outpatient stuff. And it's hard, um, especially across a big system when you have many, many clinics. And so the first thing that we have really done is um, we do have a, a statement from our um, chief medical officer for the whole system stating, you know, that they that the leadership at Alina Health supports the antibiotic stewardship. And I think that's the first step. Um, the other thing things that we've done is I talked a little bit about creating outpatient antibiotic reference guides. And so this guide really has kind of your top infectious disease states that you may see. And we use our antibiogram, we have an outpatient antibiogram. So we use that and we use the guidelines that are out there. Some obviously are outdated, but we also use the ID physicians across our system to create those guidelines. And having the guideline alone obviously is not enough because you have to try to get it to people and have them use it. So we went a step further and we created order sets for our EDs. Um, we have uh, an ED provider who is the medical director for the sepsis work across our system, and she is very vocal and very supportive for stewardship efforts, and so she has really, um, she sees patients both at Abbott and actually United, which is our other major big metro hospital, and so she has really advocated for those order sets. And basically, they're discharge order sets, and so the provider can go in, and if they want to treat for UTI, their antibiotics are right there with dosing, duration. Um, there's a first line, a second line option in there as well. So that has been, I think, very helpful. Uh, we just implemented those order sets at the beginning of this year, so we're anxious to see kind of how many times they're being used and what the provider feedback is. For the outpatient clinics, very similar. Um, we created a preference list, so basically they, the provider goes in and can type UGI. Um, if it's a pediatric patient, they have separate options, and then if it's, then if it's an adult patient, and again, the, the first line, second line antibiotics come up along with duration. And so that really has been our first step. Um, I'm anxious to kind of see what other sites are doing around outpatient because it definitely is a, a huge one to, to tackle. Yeah, I would say from our health partners' perspective, uh, we had worked, we had, there had been some work been going on and, um, and they had worked specifically on uh, avoiding treating asymptomatic bacteria as well as simple UTIs. And so we, through that group, we created a, uh, ant, or a smart set or a small order set for outpatient providers for these are the recommended antibiotics for a UTI and de-emphasizing uh, fluoroquinolone usage for that based on um, data avail or antibiogram data available. The other thing, the our antimicrobial stewardship ambulatory side patient care group has worked on 
is um, identifying that antibiotic allergies is something that are working on a process for identifying antibiotic allergies and which ones are appropriate or not. Um, I feel like as a in in house sometimes it's not as easy to identify what the issue is, um, but you know that some of these are not real antimicro or an allergies, and it limits the amount of an antibiotics you can use based on that specific allergy that's listed. And so it was a process that if they have a penicillin allergy, there's a more defined process for all outpatient providers that they can easily refer someone for skin testing. Now it's a different approach in inpatient that we still haven't figured out, but at least provide some of our outpatient providers the ability to understand when should I test a patient and, and how do I even go about this or how do I refer them to allergy for that specific uh, request. Thank you, John. Do you have a particular question from the participants that you'd like the speakers to address? We can, we can just go over some of these questions to the future here, um, uh, and I'll just make my comments on them, and anybody else that wants to join in is more than more than welcome. Um, uh, there's no question there's a bit of a disparity in terms of how uh, people will look at small hospitals as opposed to tertiary care institutions, mainly what you've heard about today. Um, it's obvious that uh, the government's going to have to make some concessions to these small hospitals but um, they're probably going to hold critical care hospitals feet to the fire in terms of having much more sophisticated antibiotic stewardship programs. Um, antibiotic flashpoints uh, or, or resistance flashpoints, we haven't reached that point yet, but I could certainly see a time down the road here that if your rate of carbapenemase producing gram negatives reaches a certain point, uh, uh, you're going to uh, be encouraged to uh, use different antibiotics, probably empirically, until you know the susceptibilities and the like. I, I don't know that that's going to happen. I don't know that CMS will set those resistant flashpoints, but it's certainly something possible down the road. One of my great fears with antibiotic stewardship is that uh, it could be a source of unfunded federal mandates. and. Uh, Antibiotic stewardship programs are very expensive. If you've got, uh, say, a quarter time of a ID physician and uh, maybe a FT of a pharmacist, uh, and uh, with a decision support system, your cost could probably be approaching two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year pretty easily. And if all of a sudden they want you educating uh, patients in the emergency room something that requires real time of, of uh, one of your staff people, uh, that could be a very expensive unfunded mandate from the federal government. So I, I, I would be very cautious in the future in terms of what the government might require us to do in terms of antibiotic stewardship. Um, another interesting thing is how do you decide how many pharmacists is enough and how many ID physicians is enough? And it would seem as though you could put together a metric that given the number of outpatient visits, inpatient visits that you have, you could probably come up with some ballpark metric of approximately how many pharmacists you need, how many physicians that you need, or what part of a physician or a pharmacist you need to properly staff one of these programs. Um, uh, another thing is benchmarking individual prescribers. Um, I've seen data on this where a group of critical care physicians, not a very large group, about 10 uh, critical care physicians was benchmarked for their antimicrobial prescribing for a year. And interestingly enough, there was about a threefold variability among the group. And that data was shared with the individual prescribers so that they knew if they were the extreme outlier on the overuse side or the extreme outlier on the uh, on the underutilizing of antibiotic side. And then the study was repeated, and everybody became centrist. And instead, the people that weren't prescribing prescribed more. The people that were over prescribing prescribed less. And at least in terms of using length of stay as your outcome parameter there really wasn't any difference. So I think benchmarking and telling individual or individual physicians and specific disciplines how they compare to their colleagues is a very potent educational tool 
and will help them probably conform to uh, whatever is normal in your institution for antibiotic use. And then I think we've already talked about automating metrics that uh, there are so many things that we need to follow and it's ridiculous that someone manually sit down and try and determine those things. We can mine these databases that are generated by Epic or whatnot and uh, uh, find sophisticated ways to generate that information with the minimum amount of, of personnel time. Did, did we have other questions? Thank you, John. Yes. So um, we're able to extend the webinar an extra five minutes if uh, our speakers are able to stay, stay with us. We have a couple questions here from our participants. Is that okay with Mary? And Absolutely. Yes? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so one of the, thank you, John, for that overview. I think those are all uh, very important comments and also some of those questions were actually from our participants as well. Uh, specifically, how do you, how do you um, determine the optimal amount of FTE per, let's say, 100 bed hospital, et cetera? for your physician, Stuart? Uh, that was a question that somebody asked. And I don't know how you're determining your amount of FPE that you need for your programs, Jessica or Mary. Yeah, so um, this is Jessica. And really what we did initially, we had done a small pilot um, on one of our med search stations. And so basically what we did is we looked to see kind of how much time we spent on each one of those patients and then kind of look at our ICU patients as well and how much time we would think that we would need to spend on those patients. And then we just extrapolated that. So we look at how many patients are on antibiotics that are not being followed by an ID physician and how long that would take for us to review all the patients in the hospital. And so it was an estimate, um, but I feel like we came pretty close with our two FGEs. We, if you see on our, um, on some of my previous slides, it kind of shows you the median number of patients that we review daily, and it's almost 70 patients, and we tend to get those patients reviewed by, um, usually by lunchtime, and that works out well because that's when most physicians are rounding. And then we have our afternoons to really work on projects or do some precepting, um, committees, that type of thing. And so I think we estimated pretty well. And, you know, if people are interested in the specifics around that, I definitely will, you know, if you email me, I can definitely um, answer some of those questions too. Okay, great. Um, Mary, I would like to ask you a question. Do you, do you have experience with antibiotic timeouts? And if you do, how did you specifically implement this? Yeah, so the within Epic we have an ability what what our initial plan was, um there is a ability in Epic that we had that after three days of therapy there was a there's a review button that uh, that happens next to that. And all you have to do is press the button and it would keep track of how often you're reviewing those. Um the big difficulty with the timeout came with how do you implement that? Um at our smaller hospitals that are critical access, they found that it was most effective. They were meeting with the physicians at rounds. Um, they could easily just talk about the antibiotics because they had so few patients and say, all right, this has been reviewed. Um, at our at m my hospital at Regions and one of the other larger hospitals, uh, Methodist, um, it was unrealistic to have the pharmacist be the one responsible, especially when unless you have protocols in place that allow you to change the antibiotics when it seems inappropriate, you're not really going to get the effect of the timeout, which is essentially, I'm thinking about maybe it's not appropriate anymore, can we de-escalate at this point? And so that's that's been our sticking point in terms of trying to figure out a way to do that, that besides, you know, get, throwing up a BPA and, and preventing them from doing anything else and making sure it goes to the right provider because you can have a BPA open for any provider who opens the chart, but then if it's a consult service and they're not really in charge of doing um, the, uh, the antibiotics for that patient, they're probably going to bypass that. And so does that count? Does that not count? Um, we are participating in the AHRQ antibiotic um, stewardship program, 
this year. And so we are working on a small team, but maybe we're hoping to come up with some ways to better identify how a timeout would work within um, our specific facility and what maybe are some ways we can do that. I think other people have seen successes with maybe having the nurse being the one um, prompt the timeout. I think the biggest thing is understanding where the biggest opportunity is at your specific institution to have a timeout and what's going to work within your institution. I think each place is going to find it a little bit different based on their their staffing in physicians, pharmacists, nursing, as well as just the, their workflow. I hope that answered the question. It does. Thank you, Mary. I, um, Two final questions, one for Jessica and one for Mary, and, and then unfortunately we'll have to end this. But so Jessica, you, you talked, I mean, yes, Jessica, you talked about uh, implementing rapid diagnostics. And we have a question that's wondering, is it pharmacy that requests the lab do the PCR test or the rapid test? Does it, did it come from the physicians or the antimicrobial stewardship team? So I guess what's the genesis for wanting to implement some of these rapid diagnostic tools? Yeah, um, so it really came from, I guess, the lab. Um, it obviously increases their their time um, in the lab, but, you know, really all the blood cultures, if they're positive, get run on the PCR. So basically, if it's a positive blood culture, they'll, they'll run it on the multiplex PCR. So it really did come from lab. As far as kind of developing a process, that came from our from our antibiotic stewardship team. So once they they decided they were going to purchase the the PCR testing. Okay, great. Uh, final question to Mary: uh, How do you get your physicians to use your order sets? I guess I could win a million dollars if I know that, but. Um, I know we've looked specifically at our order sets, and that's what's been touted by our physicians that that's what works the best. But I know when we they've looked at sepsis order set usage, it's only about 20%. So I don't know that there's an ideal way to make them use the order sets unless it's you force them to. Um, I know our specific ID physician, who's our AMS champion, actually would prefer to have more guideline base where you have um, – you may prompt someone based on what they're trying to treat towards a, a set so that you're able to get all the different um, types of criteria. So I know our sepsis order set, everyone who comes in the door seems to have sepsis if they have one SERS criteria. And, that, and our order set is specifically for septic shock and, um, and severe sepsis. So I think it not only do you want to see how they use order sets, but if they're using appropriately. And I think that's still an area for us to work on. Do you report back to them? Are you able to get the data back to the physicians, the prescribers that either not using the order sets or are or, or are working within your guidelines? I think for the sepsis order sets, they specifically do. We have a specific sepsis order set committee, um, just knowing that there's a lot of um, – uh, funding related to are they getting antibiotics and are we doing the things in, in time and so they do a lot of measurements so I think they share that some with um, with the physicians um, but that's all I know in terms of um, criteria or as looking at what physicians do that's kind of been the other million dollar question we've been working on that um, and still something we're, we're investigating but that's been asked a lot of by our physicians in terms of how do they compare to their peers. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, we're out of time. We're actually a little bit over time, but then we really appreciate your your input, Mary and Jessica and John as well. Uh, I want to thank you a lot for your time today. And then really to our participants for joining us and the great questions. I apologize that I think there were a few we didn't get to, uh, but perhaps we can have our speakers follow up with those questions and um, we can make that available via our website at the at the end. Just a reminder that the our antimicrobial stewardship webinars are all recorded and are posted to our website. And so this one will be available within the next day or so. And thank you everyone for your continued support of our project. Have a good day. <laughs>